Welcome to Missing Persons Uncovered. I'm Karen Shalev Green, and I carry out research into missing persons at the University of Portsmouth in the UK. In this podcast, we seek to understand the complexities of a global issue. Every year, hundreds of thousands of people go missing worldwide. I'm Caroline Humer, a child protection expert, and across this series, Karen and I are talking to professionals to share insights into how we can all be more aware and take action to protect vulnerable people in our communities and families from going missing. This time, we're looking at what happens when a person is found. You'd think that returned people would be met with a wave of support and public services, but as we'll find out today, the current absence of ongoing support here for adults can be a life or death situation. Increasing numbers of people are feeling the strain of loneliness, isolation and desperation following the pandemic and current cost of living crisis. Karen spoke with Susanna Drury of the UK charity Missing People. This is the main charity in the UK that helps find missing people, support families of missing loved ones and provide services when a missing person returns. Susanna's combined previous experience in national support services with nine years of service to the charity. Today, she leads three teams across the areas of policy and partnerships, research and impact and development. I'd worked with policing in lots of different roles in charities, in local authorities and the public sector. So it was a brilliant opportunity to bring that knowledge of working with the police and working on issues related to missing, like mental health, homelessness and other issues, and and bring that to a charity which has always really punched above its weight in terms of the impact it has. This combination of insights into national policy, individual support, and the nuances of social and health issues within the missing person crisis gives Susanna a unique perspective on the journey an individual and their loved ones can take from missing to found. If we could do more to recognize that adults who go missing really need support as well, just because they're over 18, nothing magic has happened to stop them being at real risk of harm while they're missing. You might think that finding a missing person is an end to the crisis, but as we'll find out, a return offers the most crucial opportunity to address the personal underlying issues and prevent a missing incident, or worse, from happening again. That moment of return isn't the end, it's the start of a new chapter really in someone's life that can be a really difficult one. We talked over the last few weeks in the podcast about the process of people going missing, why they go missing, Mm -hmm. reporting the response. But I think for people who experience a missing episode as themselves or as a loved one, there's very, very little information out there about what happens when a person comes back. We know working in this area that it's not necessarily... (laughs) all this cheering and wonderful kind of charade that the media sometimes creates. It's quite a complex process. So we wanted to really focus on that today and give people a sense of why is that complex, first of all, and then what can people do or be mindful of if they find themselves in that situation. Mm. So the first question I have, which might sound silly, but I think it's important to explore, is, so when a person goes missing, how are they found? Yeah, that person being found or coming back is seen as the end of the story when we know it really isn't. And we know, of course, that around half of all episodes of someone going missing that reported to the police are for someone that's already been missing before. So if that moment of return doesn't lead to some support to help someone address the root causes of what caused them to go in the first place, then they're likely to go missing again and and get into a really difficult cycle. But in terms of of your specific question on, on how people are found, 
We know that missing is a really varied issue is caused by all sorts of different factors from exploitation, mental health, dementia, problems at home, all sorts of reasons why someone goes missing and and there's often more than one. So as a result, the the length of time that people are missing and how they're found also really varies. So at first, it might seem like a difficult question to answer. The reasons people go missing and how they might be found are as complex and individual as the people themselves. However, the National Crime Agency in the UK does collect some data on missing people, and by combining this with the insights Susanna and her colleagues are able to gather, we are able to see some trends in how people are found. Around 40% of people do come back themselves, so return without being found by someone else. Around another 40% are found by a professional, usually the police, but also sometimes it might be a carer or or other professionals looking for them. And around 10% are found by a friend or family member. But obviously that doesn't add up to 100%. And part of the reason for that is we've really sadly large numbers of people in the UK who've been missing for a very long time and haven't been found. So around 11,000 people who've been missing for longer than a year. We don't know what the end of that story is going to be and when they're found. Unfortunately, some people will be found to have deceased while they were missing. Let's take any given scenario of a person that is found. Somebody sees them. Then what happens? You've spoken to my colleague Bethan on another podcast about how we and the police might use publicity appeals to find missing people and get the public to be our eyes and ears looking out for someone who's at risk. And and also, if a public appeal isn't the right thing to do, then we can do an appeal via just professionals so that their face isn't out in the public domain if that could put them at a higher risk. But usually what will happen with our own appeals is that we'll have our helpline number on there, which also acts as a a sighting line. So if someone sees a missing person that they've seen on one of our appeals, they can call us. They can do that anonymously and we'll take that information down and we'll pass that on to the police who will then respond and try and find that missing person based on that sighting. And obviously, sometimes the police will find them themselves if it's a professional. So usually those sightings come in and and sometimes when it's a really high profile disappearance, you know, there might be hundreds of sightings of that person. So the police need to sift through them and, and, and respond and decide what to do. So it's not always as simple as one sighting leading to the person being found, because, of course, it can take some time to respond and that person might have gone somewhere else or it might not be the right person as well. But it's worth recognising that those kinds of appeals to get the public to join the search are only one tool in finding missing people. There's tons of others as well, of course. As Susanna says, public engagement can be a powerful tool to share information and help return a missing person safely. But we've heard from a few of the other search tools on offer, such as volunteer search and rescue teams, police digital checks, search dogs and helicopters. But once found, Karen asked how an individual is physically returned to the place they're missing from. There's no one answer for this either. It may be that the police officer finds them and will take them back home or take them to a safe place if that's the right response. It might be another professional. So often we know that young people who are living in care are more likely to be reported missing and often it will be one of their carers who finds them, who goes out and looks for them and finds them or a family member and brings them back. But it's not always as simple as that, of course, because it may be that the person doesn't want to return home and it may be that they are not found by anyone but return home themselves so it can be a bit more complicated than just being being found by a police officer and being accompanied straight back home. Several years ago now colleagues of ours from Scotland done a study we we refer to as the geographies of missing persons 
And in that study, I think one of the things that really stood out to me was the understanding of how complicated it is for the people who are missing to make the decision to return. So I wondered if from your experience, you could just elaborate a little bit as to why. Yeah, I think it's such a good point because coming back, people have told us time and time again can be harder than going missing in the first place. And that's because it may be that the reason they went missing is linked to some problems at home, perhaps a relationship breakdown with someone else in that home. But also it might be because they know that the worry and anxiety they might have caused to loved ones of what being missing and the number of questions they'll face when they come back. They might have experienced some really difficult things while away. We know large numbers of children and adults while they are missing come to harm while missing and, and that could be all sorts of things but we know it's often being a victim of, of crime of exploitation of harassment and and so trying to deal with those really horrendous experiences and it's really hard to talk about what's happened when they might be trying to still process it themselves but also one, one thing that's really important to remember is that a large proportion of people who go missing are doing it in mental health crisis. So they're struggling and they may feel they've got no option but to disappear. And coming back can be really, really hard for them because that mental health crisis may well still be ongoing. And it may be that they are concerned that returning will be another trigger for their mental health potentially to get even worse. And for the family, it's really hard as well, that moment of return, because, of course, there's often relief from, from loved ones, but also that anxiety and that worry that it might happen again. They're full of questions that they want answered, that the, the return person might not be ready to answer yet. And, and so it can be quite a difficult process for both the return person and their family. And people describe it as, as really walking on eggshells and, and not knowing what the right thing to do is. It's also that there's not a lot of support and advice for people about how to come back in, into your life. That can be really, really hard. You might have to go back to work and, and colleagues might be aware that you've been missing and you might be feeling judged or you're going to have to answer impossible questions. So all of those things can make it really hard for people to return, I think. So I, I was going to follow this up with... Another question about the support needs, if we can identify what those are for those who are missing first and then for the families, just so people are more conscious of what those may be. So if, if we start with people who go missing, what would be their support needs normally? Absolutely. Well, I think the most important thing is they have time and space to process what's going on, but also someone to talk to, ideally who's independent and can offer a confidential safe space for them to open up and and start to process what's happened for them, why, why they went missing, what happened while they were away, and also to think about what help they might need to prevent it becoming a cycle and happening again. We know for both adults and children who return, they almost always get something called a safe and well check from the police. I've sometimes also called a, a prevention interview or a debrief where the police is basically just checking in. Uh, are you back? Are you OK? Have you got any immediate needs in terms of your safety, in terms of your welfare? But should also ask them questions about, you know, what, what happened and while you were away and why did you go? And for adults, that might be their only contact on return, their only kind of type of involvement from a professional. And, and so it's really important, if possible, that the police give that person time and space to open up if, if they want to do so and disclose anything, but also a feeling of not being judged for having been missing so that they feel able to talk in a safe way about what's going on for them. When the police have returned an individual and carried out the safe and well check Susanna mentioned, their professional involvement ends. 
But where does that leave a return person who needs ongoing support? And what else exists to support them through all those relationship complexities, questions and mental health issues that may still exist? Where adults may find themselves facing the way forward alone, the good news is that children have a little more support available. For children, they should also be offered something called a return home interview, also called a return discussion in Scotland, with someone who's independent from their care. So that can be all sorts of people. It might be a youth worker. It might be someone from a charity like Missing People. It could be a social worker who's not involved in their, their care, just to really give them a bit more time and space to talk about what's going on for them why they went, what happened, what support they need, a bit more of in-depth time. And that can really make a difference because I think one of the challenges is for the police that they're under real time pressure always. So with a safe and well check, you know, they're, they're, they're probably on course to then head off five minutes later to do another job. So that return home interview can be a really valuable additional amount of time and space for someone to talk and open up. But that's not going to be a silver bullet. It needs to lead to other support. So one of the things that we know really does work is a service that we offer in in one county in England where for young people who've been missing repeatedly, we'll provide them with those return interviews as a chance for them to, to sort of start the conversation. But then we'll also put in place a key worker for them for anything between six weeks and six months to really help them work out what changes they might want to make in their life and how we can support them to do that. Key workers can support children and young people in accessing mental health support, staying safe, avoiding unsafe situations, or even getting into training or work. We can do all sorts of things working with them, but in the way that they want help them to work out what path they want to get out of that cycle of going repeatedly missing and being there as a trusted adult presence really who's there for them to work out what they want to do how to get there and just to support them on that journey and we know that works because we've been able to show that for this sort of period after our support around half of those young people stop going missing altogether and around 80 percent really reduce the amount of times that they're going missing so it has a real impact as well as helping them on that important step towards thinking what's next what help do I need to be able to escape from this cycle of going missing which is fantastic news in terms of the families what needs do they particularly have you you touched on a few but I I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit you know just so we understand if you know someone that their relative has gone missing just so we as community have a better understanding of what it is that they need because it's a very difficult situation to be around right as as somebody who's experiencing it but also from a bit further out do you talk about it do you not talk about it but just so people have a bit less stigma and also a better understanding of what families might actually need at that point yeah absolutely and I think you know similar to the return person the most important thing is some some time and space without loads of questions being asked that they not, might not actually know the answers to yet about what happened and why and how are things now and so on. So giving them a bit of time and space, but letting them know that you're thinking of them. But also, I think for that family member, one of the most important thing is for them to understand that their kind of mix of emotions that they're likely to feel, that's entirely valid. And, and it might be that they need a listening ear to talk through what's going on for them and to just be able to release some of that emotion to someone that might be a professional but that might be a family member or friend because it is really difficult we've got lots of information on the missing people website for families in that situation to think through what help do they need and at missing people we're always happy to provide that support we've worked with thousands of families who've had someone come back and we can provide support through our helpline and our amazing family support team just to help them with those steps on that journey because I think 
you know, although missing is, is something that happens really commonly, you know this, it's, you know, it's, it affects up to a million people every year if you think about the person going missing and maybe five close friends or, or family members to them. It's, it affects huge numbers of people at the same time. So I'd really encourage anyone who knows someone who's going through this to tell them about the support that missing people can provide for them. And can you give us some examples of best practice? Some of the learnings that you've gathered over the years about what works mm. and what can practitioners be aware of or mindful of mm. in that moment when somebody is found? As soon as you start asking that question, it makes me think of examples that we've had where it doesn't work. And I remember speaking to an adult who'd gone missing in mental health crisis and her missing episode ended when, when she went to a hospital to just get some medical support because that's what she needed at that point. And a police officer came to do a safe and well check with her. It felt very quick to her. It felt quite tick boxy, just a few questions and then no sense of anything happening as a result and made her feel sort of almost invisible that who she was as a person, what she'd gone through, wasn't really being acknowledged. So in terms of what is good practice, I think it's for every person on return to have someone to talk to about what's been going on and for that conversation to be person-centred. There may be certain questions that need to be asked, but to do it in a way that feels like you're really engaging with that person of not sitting there with a clipboard and a set of questions, but trying to do it as a conversation that feels like it's a human to human connection. Ideally, if the police are doing that conversation, if they can do it out of uniform, that really helps because it can be a real barrier, that uniform to, to someone being able to open up and talk what's, about what's been going on. Active listening is so important there of kind of just making sure that person feels like they're being heard. But perhaps most importantly, as I was saying, that, that it leads to something else, that if they are saying, I need help with something to do with why I went missing or what happened while I was away, that that does then lead to some help because that can be the most frustrating thing. Missing is often such a clear sign that something's seriously wrong. And if someone comes back and that doesn't lead to any support, then it feels as if that sign has been ignored and that person feels completely ignored. Absolutely. I, mean, I also think in terms of, like you said, the attitude that people bring, that compassion is at the forefront. Just for people to put themselves in a place where they're possibly the most vulnerable they've ever been. And when you're in that space, what is it that you're actually looking for? And I think all of us are looking for compassion at that moment, not judgment, not dismissal. It's just say, uh, I see you and I hear you and I'm sorry that you're going through this. You're right in terms of the next step that are also more practical to, to actually help someone. Still on the note of best practice, Susanna also circled back to the issue of how little support is available to returned adults after police checks have been carried out. The one thing that is lacking, which we think could make a huge difference, is, is more support for adults who come back. Because there's such strong links between adults going missing and mental health issues and dementia, but also increasingly our understanding of exploitation being an issue for adults as well as children, really having proper services in place where adults after return can talk to someone about what's going on in depth and in exactly the way you rightly say with compassion without judgment but then that leads to something else and that would be fantastic we were able to get funding a few years ago to run a service like that in wales and it made such a difference to those adults who had been missing i can think of one who essentially an adult who'd gone missing and it was it was linked to incredible feelings of loneliness and, and mental health issues and of course we know that those are growing issues in our society and we're really worried at missing people to see the impact of first of all the pandemic and now the cost of living crisis on people's 
mental health and, and well-being and just we are hearing more and more from people that they're just in desperate situations they can't see a way out of and they go missing. So for them to come back and then nothing happens, that's terrifying. You know, it sadly it can be a life and death issue. And if that warning sign of them going missing and returning isn't heeded, then sadly we know that large numbers of people go missing and will take their own lives while missing. And that service that we were able to provide was able to just step in and basically help people connect with their local community. That that person who was incredibly lonely and experiencing significant mental health impacts of that loneliness, when they were back to find out what was going on for them, to connect them with different groups and voluntary roles in their community. And that made all the difference. You know, it doesn't have to be expensive services. It's what that person needs in that moment. So it just feels like if, if we could do more to recognise that adults who go missing really need support as well. You know, just, just because they're over 18, nothing magic has happened to, to stop them being at real risk of harm while they're missing, but also when they've come back. And I think sometimes it's actually the adults that are almost more at risk because there aren't necessarily all the support mechanisms that are in place for children. Because we, we just, as societies throughout the world, we understand the children are vulnerable. And I think there's almost the taking for granted that just because you're an adult doesn't mean you're not in a very similar state of vulnerability and actually the support mechanisms that would help children are not there for you as an adult anymore. Yeah, it's complicated with missing, of course, as, as you know, Karen, because an adult has a right to be missing, they have a right to disappear, um, but they also have a right, as you say, to, to be looked for and supported if they need safeguarding, if they need support to deal with what's going on for them too and we're really concerned about the people who don't get reported to the police we know the majority of children who do run away or go missing aren't ever reported to the police and we know also for adults there's a lot of people who aren't reported to the police but sometimes it's also the police deciding not to record them as a missing person because of that right to be missing and that right to privacy as an adult but that can be really concerning because we often know that there's there's real risks there and we sometimes have people contacting us worried because the police won't accept their adult missing loved one as a missing person because they're an adult and those risks aren't fully recognised. But as you rightly say, they can be more at risk and, and we know adults are more at risk of dying by suicide while missing than children, just as one example of that. Susanna shared how Missing People Charity are sharing public resources for anyone who is concerned about how they can better understand and support a returned person in their community. We have information that's more on our website, missingpeople.org.uk, which is more targeted families around the return and, and to sort of help them understand what the missing person who's returned might be going through, but also about what might be going on for them and what support's available so anyone can access that. But there's also some really valuable research, as you mentioned, there's the geographies work that was done, gosh, almost 10 years ago now, but is obviously still valid. And my old colleague Lucy Holmes did some research, which is on our website as well, called When the Search is Over, just explaining that whole process of people reconnecting and returning and some of the challenges of that. One of the things that we really want to develop and is a real gap at the moment is some kind of peer-to-peer -peer support for people who have returned because I think for those people we've talked about what a difficult process it is and maybe the best person to help them is someone that's been through something similar themselves. I really hope you're gonna be able to do that because it sounds absolutely appropriate and it will be a very helpful way forward. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Missing Persons Uncovered. And thanks to Susanna for sharing those tools and insights. When a missing person is returned, the key elements of making time and space for them, of listening to and seeing them are crucial support tools for any professional or individual who wants to help. 
Once more, by providing ongoing support, emotionally and practically, it allows the return person to access what's there on their own human timeline, not anyone else's. That concludes our first series of this podcast, but we'll be back soon. So please follow this podcast on your favorite app and join us on social media for updates. I'm Karen Shalev-Green. And I'm Caroline Humer. Thank you for listening.